Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon and welcome to the Olympia Regional Airport Master Plan Update Technical Advisory Committee meeting number one. We appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, the meeting will last about an hour and a half and um, we're gonna try to stay within that because we know that your schedule is, is filled with lots of other meetings. So thank you again for your time. So we'll start by just with some introductions of the project team and then we'd like you to introduce yourself as well. Um, so I'm Leah Whitfield. I am the project manager for the master plan. I'm Justin Hyde. I'm uh, the assistant project manager and lead planner uh, with the aviation planning group. Uh, Steve Mirza. I am the aviation planner. Darren, I'm I think you're on mute. <laughs> but Darren Murata is our lead aviation engineer from Dow, a subconsultant firm for us. And then we also have Renee Dowlin, who's not on the call today, but an important member of the project team as the environmental planner. I um, mean, I'm sure you'll have a chance to meet her at the next meeting. Um, so now we'd like to just go around and maybe we'll start um, with Rudy at the airport, but we'd like to just um, have each of you, um, I'll kind of call on you. And then if you can just introduce yourself and give us your name and, um, the organization that you're representing on the Technical Advisory Committee. Okay, well, hi everybody, welcome. Uh, I think all of you know me, who you should know me, who are on the, the team here or, and the committee. Um, I'm the Chief Morale and Blame Officer here for everything that happens at the airport. So thank you for joining. Thanks, Rudy. Um, so I'm just gonna go down the list and it looks like we'll start with the FAA with Ben. Hi, my name is Ben Mello. I'm a community planner with the Seattle ADO. Um, the overseeing the project from a FAA standpoint, we help fund a um, portion of this project and uh, we are responsible for uh, approving the airport layout plan and approving the forecasts and we accept all the documents within this master planning document. So uh, I'm looking forward to it uh, and um, if you have any questions for me, I hope to answer them through this call or uh, feel free to reach out to me via email or through uh, a call. Thanks. Hi, I'm Agnes Fisher from the FAA, Seattle ADR. I'm the community planner and Ben has been working on the Washington airports, a number of them that were assigned to him on my behalf. So I'm here to listen and follow through when he finally goes away from some of these projects. Agnes, um, and we have Elon Logan as well. Yeah, hi everyone. Elon Logan, um, environmental protection specialist for Seattle ADO. I'm here to, um, you know, support Ben and the planners on any environmental questions that come up and really to just kind of stay informed in this process. Um, I'm not uh, officially on the TAC, uh, but just as a FAA, FAA perspective um, participant. Thanks. Um, so I think now we'll start kind of going around the room with the TAC members. Um, we'll start with Brad. Sorry, uh, Brad Medrid with the city of Tumwater. I'm planning manager for long range planning with the city. Thank you, Brad. Um, and Cameron? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Cameron Wilson. I'm the 2021 chair for the Port of Olympia uh, Citizens Advisory Committee. Thanks for joining us, Cameron. Uh, next up, we have Jeff Powell. He might be muted. He's talking. Uh, try one more time. How's that? Much hey. better. Hi, Jeff. Hi. I'm Jeff Powell. I'm uh, with Prime Development Group. We've developed about 75,000 feet of hangar space here at Olympia, and uh, happy to be with you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next up, Katrina. Uh, Katrina Van Every, Thurston Regional Planning Council. Um, we are in charge of doing a regional transportation plan and aviation has to be part of that. Uh, 
Uh, Krista? I'm Lieutenant Krista Gradonis. I represent State Patrol. So I'm am now the new lieutenant out here replacing retired Lieutenant Jim Milba. So any future correspondence for the State Patrol is going to go through me now. And then I also have my sergeant. Jeff Hattabert, yeah, I'm the sergeant here of Air Operations for State Patrol. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. Next, we have Max. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Max Platts, and I'm an aviation planner with uh, Washdot Aviation. Great. Thanks for joining us, Max. And we have Mike. Hey, everybody. Mike Cuthbert, uh, Washington State Department of Natural Resources. Uh, we're the wildfire aviation outfit. We're a tenant. And is there anyone else I missed? The list was jumping around a little bit, but I think that's everyone. I think there's just a couple of folks that were, were missing that were invited. Okay, great. Well, thank you. We'll go ahead and kind of jump in, uh, go through a couple of ground rules first and then jump into the agenda. Um, so we're going to go ahead, it looks like um, mute everyone um, for the presentation to eliminate any background noise. Um, if you have a comment or a question throughout, and feel free to leave your video on or off, totally up to you. Um, but there should be a raise hand button. If you click on the participants tab, kind of at the bottom likely of your screen in Zoom, um, you can pull up the participants. It looks like the graphic on the right. And then at the bottom right, there should be a raise hand button. Sometimes, um, depending on the version of Zoom you have, also it might be under reactions, which would be at the bottom of your uh, main screen, not under the participants. But you should be able to raise your hands there as well. Feel free to send myself or Justin or Hasib um, a message as well in the chat box if you have any um, specific questions, uh, if we don't see your hand raised, um, or if you just have any general comments, um, we'll make sure we save those if you send those in the comment chat box. I don't think we have any members of the general public, um, but we might have some of those join us and um, we'll be happy to take any questions they have at the end of the TAC meeting if time allows. Otherwise, they're welcome to submit any comments or questions as well in the chat box. So our agenda for the next 75 minutes or so is to really um, help you understand what is an airport master plan and what is it not. Um, so we want to make sure we follow the FAA's um, guidance on what an airport master plan is and isn't. So we'll talk about that. And then what is your role as a member of the technical advisory committee? And then talk a little bit about just the overall project schedule and then the public involvement plan. Obviously, the TAC is one portion of that public involvement plan, but what else are we doing to outreach to the public and the community? And then um, dive into kind of our existing research and analysis with the airport existing conditions. So what infrastructure do we have at the airport today? And then um, we did a user survey over the course of kind of March and early April, and we have the results of that survey that we wanna kind of talk about issues and needs that we learned from the survey, and then kind of have that feed into an airport issues to round table with you and we really want that to be your opportunity to be heard as a member of the TAC and um, make sure we understand what issues and needs you see at the airport. And we're gonna do a little bit of a SWOT analysis as a part of that. And then we'll wrap up with the aviation forecast, um, the draft information that we've gotten started on recently, and then um, touch on just where we go from here. So according to the FAA, and as Ben mentioned, the FAA is funding this project. Um, an airport master plan is a comprehensive study of an airport that usually describes the short, the medium, and the long-term development plans to meet future aviation demand at the airport. And the master plan's purpose is really not to solve those general management operations and maintenance issues. If there's always a light out there, this is not the, the forum to necessarily complain that this one light bulb is are always out unless it's a capital infrastructure issue. But what we're really here to talk about is what capital infrastructure does the airport need in the short, mid, mid and long term. Um, and we're really looking at that 20 year planning horizon, but of course we still don't wanna be short sighted and we wanna make sure we're planning for anything beyond 20 years that we're aware of as well. It does follow an FAA advisory circular for airport master plans and kind of included in that is kind of a typical master plan process. And we start with the inventory. And so we're documenting existing conditions in that infrastructure that exists at the airport today and what kind of condition it is in. And then we go into an aviation forecast. And in the aviation forecast, we look at based aircraft. So aircraft that live at the airport more than 50% of the time. And we're also looking at operations. So a takeoff 
or a landing at the airport is in operation. And so we wanna look at kind of existing conditions for that. And then we wanna forecast that out five, 10, 15, and 20 years. So that way we know what infrastructure we need to meet that demand in the future, especially if the type of aircraft coming and going out of Olympia is changing. So out of the forecast, we'll have a critical aircraft and that will really feed into our facility requirements. And we'll take a look at that critical aircraft and look at the existing infrastructure, look at the FAA standards and say, are we short? Are we meeting all of the standards? What are our deficiencies to meet those design standards? And then what are our deficiencies to meet capacity? So we know there's a hangar wait list, so we need more hangers. Where would those hangers go? Um, so we kind of define under facility requirements the infrastructure that's needed in the next 20 years. And then that feeds into the alternatives section of the master plan. And that's the fun part where we really get to, you know, roll up our sleeves, have a map and look and see where things could go on airport property. And so we'll, we'll lay out several different alternatives. Um, we'll analyze those, we'll evaluate those against different criteria and come up with the preferred alternative. And that preferred development alternative will feed into the airport layout plan. And as Ben mentioned, the airport layout plan and the aviation forecast are both formally approved by the FAA. So that's really the two key parts that the FAA is involved in. And the airport layout plan is, is a stack of maps and it essentially depicts everything on the airport. And in order for something to be developed on airport property, it needs to be shown on that approved airport layout plan. So it's kind of an important step in the process. And then we also develop a capital improvement plan and an implementation. So whatever projects we see that need to happen in the next 20 years, whether they're kind of a pavement maintenance or you know, digging up and reconstructing a piece of pavement or building a new taxiway, all of that gets fed into that capital improvement plan. And we look at kind of the timing and the cost of those projects. So again, we appreciate your time and um, commitment to being a member of the Technical Advisory Committee or the TAC as we refer to it as. Um, it's a limited time commitment. We always aim for our meetings to be about 90 minutes long. Um, and it's a commitment of four different meetings. And the first couple are going to be virtual via Zoom and then hopefully we'll get a little, little more post COVID and be able to meet in person very soon. But we really want you to provide that representative input from whatever organization you're representing. And that's really important to the success of the master plan update. And then of course, we also want your feedback on the draft report and anything else that you see kind of from your perspective um, in regards to the master plan. And of course, provide suggestions at any point in time. You're always have, um, welcome to reach out to Justin or myself for the airport as well. So not a big commitment, but we understand your time is very valuable. So we have a, we've developed a public involvement plan and that's either being posted on the project website or, um, or will be very soon. But we do have a project website um, or web page on the airport's existing website um, with just general public information about the project. And then of course, any drafts, um, documents that we develop as we develop the chapters, those will go on the website as well. As I mentioned, we did complete a user survey in March and early April um, to gain some input from tenants at the airport and users of the airport. And then of course, the four technical advisory committee meetings, with this one being the first one this afternoon. And then we'll also hold four public open houses throughout the course of the project. And then we'll also accept comments from anyone throughout the project. We actually have a project email address we'll share at the end, but it's ampupdate at portolympia.com. So of course, any comments are always welcome from the TAC or from the public. And then of course, we want that ongoing feedback from you um, because no one knows your airport better than you do. So kind of the overall airport master plan update schedule. Um, so the project kicked off the first week of March and we conducted a site visit in mid-March and really started our investigation phase of the project. And there's really kind of three key phases of a master plan, investigation, solutions, and implementation. And so we're in the investigation phase right now, and we're about halfway through that phase. So we're still kind of wrapping up the inventory chapter. We have a draft forecast chapter, and we're just getting started on the airport facility requirements. And then we'll move into the solutions kind of when we get to the midsummer, where we really start looking at alternatives. So where would things go? What infrastructure do we need? I'm starting to look a little more in detail about any environmental impacts that those projects might have and the criteria that we want to evaluate the alternatives against. And then we'll eventually have a recommended preferred development alternative. And we'll meet with the public several times over the course of investigation and solutions, and then move into that implementation, which is where we really get into the cost estimates. 
what is the project's cost? How do we fund it? And that airport layout plan, and of course a draft and final report. Um, so it's about an 18 month schedule. Um, so starting in March of this year and completing next summer, 2022. All right. Uh, again, my name is Justin Hyde, and I'm going to talk about the airport existing conditions and what we what we have at your airport through the inventory process. We are just basically cataloging everything and making sure that we have the right data to be able to base our preferred development plan off of. And so, what we have is two runways: runway one seven three five and a crosswind runway of runway uh, eight two six. There's nine taxiways out there. Uh, named taxiways that are, uh, some are lighted, some have reflectors. Most of the reflectors are on the east side of the airport, and then the lighting would be on the west side, closer to the control tower. And uh, basically, we, we want to categorize everything so that we know what we have. And so we start with the businesses that we have on the airfield, and that's a, a fantastic list, and it's continuing to grow, and, and we may not have gotten all of them in this list, uh, but we want to make sure that we're highlighting that we have the Highway Patrol and, and Department of Natural Resources. Uh, some of these uh, businesses, along with the, excuse me, the, the medevac flights are critical to the community, region, and state. And so we really uh, want to factor in the, what they bring to the, to the area because they're at the airport. Additional things such as the, the museum or the, and the FBOs, along with the avionics shops and maintenance uh, facilities with A&R, uh, those are businesses that people will come to uh, from the region just to be able to maintain their aircraft, maintain their licenses, proficiencies, and uh, keeping everything up. And so that's it's a fantastic thing to have so much on the airfield. And then also uh, Olympia is home of uh, Washdot Aviation uh, Division, which is a, a fantastic asset to have as well. So looking at that inventory and kind of breaking it down as far as the runways go, uh, basically we have a, a primary runway, which is runway 1735, and then uh, the crosswind, which is 826. Uh, we'll kind of focus on the 1735 in, in this section, uh, but to briefly talk about 826, it's basically, it, it is a basic visual runway. Uh, there's, not, there's no lighting. It's uh, shorter than the primary. It's uh, 4,157 feet long. It does have a nice width of 150 feet, um, but that, that exceeds the, the B2 category requirements that it is. And when I talk about category requirements, that B2 that you see for runway 826 and C2 that you see for 1735, uh, that's basically just saying what is that runway built to, to be able to handle aircraft uh, that are coming in. And I'll explain more of that in the next slide. Uh, as far as the weight capacities go, the runways have excellent weight capacities uh, to be able to handle the aircraft that are utilizing the airport and future aircraft as well. As far as lighting, we have high intensity runway lighting on the, on the primary runway that has a pre precision approach for runway 17, non-precision for 35. And then uh, uh, the, the 17 approach side has, has approach lighting with the medium intensity approach lighting system with the runway alignment indicator lights. Those are the, the flashing lights you see uh, heading into the runway on the north end. And then we have runway end identifier uh, lights on both ends of 1735 along with uh, PAPIs. And those PAPIs are the, the red boxes that you see from the ground. Uh, there's four of them on, on each uh, end of the runway. And that gives the pilots as they're flying in a three degree angle uh, as they're approaching the airfield and they're able to see it with uh, red lights and white lights as they fly the right angles. So as I mentioned, uh, the aircraft design classification, uh, what this is, is it's a two-part factor. You got the air, 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 aircraft approach category, which is the, the, the A, B, and C, and D, and then the airplane design group, which is the Roman numeral that follows it. So runway 826 is a B2 runway. And which is still capable of uh, handling Cessna's citations. It handles approach speeds up to uh, 121 knots and uh, is, is a fantastic designation for a crosswind runway that you have. As far as the uh, primary runway, we got C2, and that's able to handle approach speeds up to 141 knots. The two behind it with the Roman numerals basically says that it's built for a wingspan of less than 79 feet. Now, because these are 150 feet wide, 
we are that's really getting into the three category. And so that's something that we want to uh, keep in mind as we as we go into the future and facility requirements of what's necessary at the airport and what what we're going to grow into with that the forecast. Part. As far as approaches, uh, Olympia has fantastic approaches. Runway 17 has an ILS approach that's uh, down to 200 feet with a half a mile. And then the GPS approach gives you the same, same operating procedures. There's an RNAV approach for one or for 35 down to 700 feet with one mile visibility. And uh, VOR for 35 uh, has the same factors. And then you got a circling approach as well with the VOR. There are, have been some comments in the surveys and things of wanting additional approaches or lower approaches for the 3.5 and so that's things that we will be able to look at throughout the master. So when we when we take a deep dive into those land side existing conditions, that's a, we're going to kind of focus on this side for the for the east portion of the airport. There's two private FBOs and they're both providing fuel hangers and flight instructions, similar things that normal FBOs would supply throughout the area. There is a, currently a, a lack of maintenance at the airport and I know both uh, FBOs are kind of looking at that and trying to figure out uh, options and what can be uh, brought to the field uh, for the users. And then with fuel, we have uh, Jet A fuel and 100 low lead fuel available. There's a fantastic fuel storage facility that's able to bring in two more tanks or hold two more tanks. It's built for eight and there's currently six. There's 34,000 gallons currently stored in three tanks for each uh, Jet A and 100 low lead. And then there's multiple fuel trucks for each type that the FBOs use to fill aircraft uh, for their respective clients. Parking is a, a big concern for most airports as far as uh, where the user is going to park once they come to the airport. And right now, there's 13 public use spaces near the airport administration building. But when we're talking about the private businesses, there's a, a smattering of, of parking available for the, the users and businesses that are out there. Uh, that's all private parking and regulated by the, each individual business. Then on the west side, we also have some other businesses, the Peninsula Group, Soloy Corporation, Northwest Marine and Craig Properties as well. And then I'm gonna pass it back to Leah to go over some environmental existing conditions that factor into the airport here. So that's the part of the inventory of existing conditions. We also look at a variety of environmental conditions. And so there's kind of a long list here and I won't read all of them to you, but essentially we're taking a look at all of these existing conditions in regards to the Olympia airport. So air quality, compatible land uses, are we protecting the land use around the airport? Um, any fish, wildlife and plants, um, endangered species, any noise concerns, socioeconomic impacts, wetlands, et cetera. But you know, just to clarify, so the master planning process is really, it's just that, it's a planning process, but prior to any construction um, of any improvement, the any project will have to still go through that NEPA and SEPA process. And so um, this is kind of the, the start. So we're gathering that inventory data. When we get into the alternatives, we'll look at, at the actual impacts of any proposed development. Um, but then there's still that, that environmental process that still has to be completed before any project actually, you know, any dirt gets moved and a project gets built. Um, so we're in the process of kind of um, inventorying the exist, existing environmental, exist, existing environmental conditions, there we go. Um, but then of course, we also have a habitat conservation plan that is kind of ongoing as well. I'm gonna to go to the next slide, Justin. Um, so essentially the city of Tumwater and the Port of Olympia are jointly developing a Bush Prairie Habit Habitat Conservation Plan or the HCP. And the goal of that HCP is really to um, balance growth and the preservation of endangered species within the city of Tumwater and the urban growth area. In particular towards the endangered species of the Olympia pocket gopher, the streaked horn lark, and the organ spotted frog. And so it's being undertaken to look at those three particular species. And um, that project is separate outside of the master plan and has a consultant team. It's currently still in development. I believe they're close to a full draft. Um, so we're kind of working with that HCP team to make sure that anything we do um, takes into account the information that they've already gathered 
um, and the impacts that they see to those endangered species. So we're gonna work closely with the HCP team and um, include any of their information in the master plan. But still a kind of a separate effort, but ongoing kind of parallel. So moving on to the user survey. So we conducted an airport user survey and the survey was sent out by the by the port to any of the tenants at the airport. And um, the questions aren't necessarily in any order of one through 10, but we wanted to just highlight a little bit of information that we learned from the survey. Um, so one of the questions was, what is the nature of your flight? So business pleasure or training and just kind of local flying. And so you'll see kind of the response breakdown there. It doesn't add up to 100% because you could choose more than one, but it does really show that there's a variety of uses that the Olympia Regional Airport is currently serving for both business pleasure. And then of course, a lot of training that's happening at the airport, especially on the rotor craft side. So we also looked at if if you're using the airport for business aviation use, what is that use? And so we have a variety of things, about 10 of them there. So um, anything ranging from fire support, aviation, emergency response, to law enforcement, of course, um, training, commuting, um, traveling to other properties that they might own and, re and rent, um, as well as commercial airline repair and overhaul of components and airframe. So a variety of business aviation uses that are happening at the airport. So in any airport master plan, of course, runway length is a big topic. Um, so one of the questions we ask is, are the runway lengths as they exist today adequate for your needs as a pilot? And um, overwhelmingly, we heard yes. So 28 people um, responded to the question and over 90% of those folks said that yes, the airport meets their needs um, as it is today. A couple of people did say that they would like additional length. Um, and then we also had a couple of comments um, as a part of that, no, they, they wanted diff dis additional length. One wanted a grass airstrip or the, to be able to use the infield for grass landings. And then one person said um, long enough to be able to attract commercial air carriers. Um, but the good news is, is the airport is currently meeting most of the needs when it comes to runway length of the existing users. Um, aircraft storage is always also a big topic as a part of a master plan. And as I mentioned earlier, we do have a hangar wait list right now at the airport. Um, so we ask folks, where do they store their aircraft? Do they store it on a tie down on the ramp or do they use a hangar? And this is important to kind of differentiate because as we look forward to facility requirements and kind of looking at capacity needs, um, how many hangars do we need? What size of hangars do we need? Um, and most folks said that they do prefer hangers and they use hangers at the airport. Um, only a few people said that they like to use the tie downs. So the next question we asked was, do you want to build a hangar at the Olympia airport? And can you give us some information about the size? And so we had 11 yeses to that answer or to that question and 17 no's. Um, so not quite half of the folks said that they would like to build a hangar. And the sizes really ranged from a 40 by 40 up to a 100 by 300 foot hangar. But this is all really important information as we move into facility requirements and development alternatives. So just to kind of summarize, 36% of the respondents currently use the airport for business. 39% um, of the users expressed an interest in building a hangar. And 93% indicated that the runway meets their needs today. Um, so the top needs by based users, um, one of the top needs we see at every airport is self-serve fuel. So as Justin mentioned, the airport has some great fuel tanks, um, lots of capacity, but it's all by truck. So if someone comes in after hours or if they don't want to use an FBO um, to fuel their aircraft, there's no self-serve fuel option for that 100 low lead in particular. Um, also additional hangars to either rent or own. Again, we have a hangar wait list. Um, the condition of pavement was a concern from a few people and then airfield lighting in particular taxiway lighting was a request. And then as Justin mentioned, you will have some great approaches but continuing to improve those approaches. And the top desires by the based users, um, a restaurant, improved security. Everyone wants to be able to um, protect their investment in their aircraft or their facility. And then commercial or air cargo service also came up and then more ramp or apron space for helicopters. We've got a lot of uh, kind of constraints there with a lot of the rotorcraft training that goes on and kind of fixed wing kind of intermingling. 
So now that you've kind of seen what the issues are from the survey, and some of you may have participated in that survey, and if so, we greatly appreciate your time. Um, we know it takes time to complete those things, but it's very valuable information to the planning team. Um, we'd like to kind of go around a roundtable discussion and really kind of do a SWOT analysis that says, you know, what are the strengths of the airport? What are the weaknesses at the airport? What are the opportunities and what are the threats? Um, so kind of starting with strengths, what are the positives that you see or what infrastructure are positives at the airport that you see that are benefiting you and your organization or that could benefit additional users coming to the airport? So if anyone has any strengths they would like to bring up, if you just wanna raise your, raise your hand, um, we will call on you. Again, the, the raise your hand button should be under reactions or if you go to participants, it should be bottom right. But we'd love to kind of start with the positives that you see at the airport. I'll kind of start with one while we're, oh, let's see, Krista's got one. Um, okay. Go ahead, I'm going to jump in. Uh, sure. I just want to, I want to say a positive when it comes to winter operations. I think uh, the Olympia crew does a very good job ensuring that you know, there's not a lot of flights in and out during, you know, inclement weather with snow and ice, but uh, we can always count on the Olympia crew to get the job done the best they can. And uh, we just want to say thank you and uh, we appreciate that efforts. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's great. I know snow and ice is not as common in Washington, so it's great to hear that winter operations are going so well. Um, Mr. Powell. Uh, I think the couple of things that we do well here and some strengths is that we do have a pretty secure environment, which is appreciated by the group that we have here in our 75,000 foot compound. And it's a nice um, flow, if you will, of how things get maintained. I would back up what the state patrol said. Uh, we do have good maintenance. We are very thankful for the taxi lanes being maintained and the runways being maintained in a very good manner. Uh, this is a busy time of year for the airport and they're out there mowing the grass so we don't have that as an encumbrance and it does give us the line of vision that we need when we're taxiing in or exiting an airport uh, runway. Uh, the other thing is that I think we have really, uh, I agree with uh, perhaps a, a precision approach on 3-5, but the approaches that we are uh, currently using are very good. They work continuously. Uh, I don't have anything really negative to say about what's going on with the airport. Uh, yes, we could use some more parking. I think that does become a problem at some point. And we are going to want to look at that as we press on. Okay. And by parking, just to clarify, um, aircraft parking or auto parking? Uh, really, for us, it's auto parking. We have a we have a wonderful facility here. There's lots of tie downs and opportunity for transient airport or airplanes. Um, but really it does sometimes, uh, parking is a bit of a pinch. Okay, great. Okay, any other strengths anyone would like to add? One other thing I would say, if I may. Absolutely. Um, some airports don't have this feature, but quite frankly, we're very fortunate. We have never had any real flooding activity here. And that's been really a good thing because there is other airports that do suffer from that. And I, I would encourage everybody to think about that when we do the development of whatever happens. Uh, we are blessed with some very good soils that do infiltrate well, but I think it's important to note that. I think we had another screen. Just, uh, I hit raise and then I jumped. Yeah, yeah. I would say uh, maybe not as much as the functioning of the airport, but aesthetically, um, the airport is a nice break in an otherwise quickly developing landscape. And so I think the open skyline that the airport provides um, is, is somewhat aesthetically um, uh, pleasing, especially, as I said, uh, we continue to develop in that area. Great, that's a great one. Any other kind of strengths? I mean, I, a strength I definitely see is that you're, 
while you are kind of constrained on all sides, the, the port um, does, the port and the airport do own significant land to be able to kind of have that buffer and then also have available land um, for development if it is needed or warranted in the future. And that's that's always something from a planning perspective, it's great, great to see that land has been kind of preserved and um, land use, I think as well, um, the port has done a great job with that. Uh, Cameron? Um, yeah, I think uh, having the airport itself is is a big benefit to uh, to the region altogether. Um, you know, as we saw when the uh, train accident happened, when I five uh, experiences a, a shutdown, it's it's an important asset for uh, the region to have for for emergency response and, and things like that. So just overall, um, the presence of the airport uh, is something that I think a lot of us see value in. Yeah, that, that medevac role can be a really important role. Um, and, and like you said, any, any other um, transportation needs that you have in states of emergency as well. Any other strengths before we jump on to weaknesses? Okay. Um, so kind of weaknesses, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a, a con against the airport by, by any means, but, um, you know, just thinking of weaknesses, we've not heard a lot of uh, complaints about the tower hours. That seems to be working well, but there are some operations outside of tower hours um, that do occur, but they seem to be occurring uh, smoothly. So I'd love to hear any, any other suggestions uh, for weaknesses, Michelle. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm actually going to add one more to the uh, the the, the benefits. Um, sorry that I overlooked. Is that we've been successful in um, uh, uh, coordinating on uh, retaining the listed species on site while letting while allowing airport operations to continue. So I think we have a good working relationship that has benefited a listed species, or at least allowed it to retain itself there. And I see that as a benefit. Absolutely. Thank you. So obviously auto parking was brought up um, as something that's maybe a little weak and we need additional auto parking. And I know just kind of the, the constraints of the helicopter operations with some of the fixed wing, the helicopters are kind of tucked in there and it seems to be working well, but um, you know it's always great when we can try to separate fixed wing and rotorcraft as much as possible. Any other weaknesses? I know one that has been uh, brought up throughout the survey was the the lighting on the east side, and I, I don't know if any of you uh, have any comments or thoughts on that as far as you know are the reflectors working or 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 would there be a desire for lights in that area or on portions of that area to get to the west side? Krista. Hi, this is Jeff again. Um, one of the weaknesses I would bring up would be, you know, there's limitations I get with the helicopter departures, you know, close proximity to our hangar, which is pretty sizable hangar, is that it seems to be uncomfortable at times, not all the time, but, you know, what other options do we have? I know limited, but uh, there's been some um, complaints forwarded to the tower and some of the other stakeholders on the airport disregarding the close proximity on the departures or arrivals, helicopters uh, uh, in relation to the hangar and offices. Great, that's great information. Thank you. Justin, would you mind going ahead and switching to the, the graphic that we can pull up real quick? Absolutely. I'd love kind of any input on, you know, specific areas for auto parking where auto parking is really needed. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you have any kind of input on that. Well, when we developed our facility here, we uh, collaborated with the port and we added additional auto parking outside of our facility. Mm -hmm. And that worked out pretty well um, as ANR, which is our 42,000 foot uh, user uh, expanded and, and continues to um, maintain their presence here, 
uh, I can see the opportunity for us in the future to perhaps add a little bit more additional down where we are, but I don't want to sound selfish. The other uh, perimeter road that we have does have opportunity for parking. Some of it's just not designated. So if we were going to do a budget, I would say you probably need to budget some money for auto parking on the outside fence area. So at least there's designated parking and it doesn't seem to be somewhat um, haphazard, if you will. Okay. okay. Any other kind of issues, needs, weaknesses um, that anyone would like to see the master plan take a look at? Okay. Um, so opportunities. So what opportunities do you see that the Olympia Airport and the port could take advantage of? Um, we've kind of talked about the, the strength and the benefit of, of having the airport there, and it really is an asset to the community. So um, what opportunities can the um, airport take advantage of? I think you still should always look at uh, regional use. Uh, you do have land to the south. Uh, the, the airport runway has a lot of infrastructure already in place. I know that may not be a very popular comment for some folks, but uh, as an opportunity, that is a tremendous opportunity. We're easy on, easy off I-5. And uh, that would be one that's, I think, a very obvious opportunity. The other opportunities, if you were thinking about development of the facility in general, is that we could be soliciting for other types of airport support, and that could be a maintenance facility for a particular line of aircraft. It could also be a sales and service facility for a particular line of aircraft. It's not always something that's available, but those are some opportunities I think we should at least uh, do, a, if you will, cursory marketing for. I know both of the FBOs are, are very interested in how, how a maintenance shop could come to the airport and expand those capabilities. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely an opportunity for, I'm, as a user, uh, I have to take my aircraft up to uh, Spanaway and, uh, or not Spanaway, but uh, Puyallup and have my uh, plane serviced up there. Yeah, it'd be great to be able to kind of keep that, the jobs more local and that revenue local to the community. Right. Any other, any other opportunities? This Anyone kind of? Max. Oh, go ahead, Max. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't sure I was off mute. Uh, yeah, I, I'd echo some of what Jeff said with the, um, you know, the opportunity for commercial service. Um, you know, I think that, you know, part of what we're working on at WashDOT with the Commercial Aviation Coordinating Commission is really expanding, you know, or trying to find a balance with all the airports in the region to help support some of the, the regional demands for aviation. And that's, you know, that's air cargo, passenger service, and general aviation. So, there, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways that Olympia could possibly help out. The location is a, a great location for, you know, the, the population is, is advancing slowly to the south. Um, and, you know, I think the importance of the airport's only going to get more and more. Um, another, another opportunity I, I see is, you know, Olympia was uh, identified in the R, you know, the WashDOT electric aircraft feasibility study as one of the six beta test sites. Um, and so I think that as that technology really takes off and, and becomes a reality, I think that Olympia would be poised to take advantage of that, both for regional service, kind of intrastate and interstate travel, um, as well as uh, the, the training aspect and, um, that that can bring about. Also, you know, and, and that kind of goes to some of the helicopter parking, you know, as the, you know, EV tolls and stuff like that start to come online, you know, uh, you know, those helipad vertiport type things will, will become more and more important. Great. Thanks for bringing both of those up. So um, just 
for the committee's information. So as Max mentioned, um, Olympia was one of the beta test sites um, as a part of WashDOT's electric aviation study. And so we will be incorporating that kind of throughout the master plan. And then we'll also be looking at, um, you know, other kind of emerging technologies, whether it's biofuels or um, urban air mobility and um, regional air mobility as well. And then um, looking at that EV tall, um, kind of that vertical takeoff and landing uh, uh, type aircraft as well. Uh, Cameron? There we go. Um, so uh, I would see an opportunity for attracting a company. That, um, so this uh, um, service called JSX uh, started operating out of Boeing Field. It's a, a small, uh, not private jet, but you know, twenty to 25 passenger uh, jet service. They were uh, regional. Uh, they're no longer flying out of Boeing Field, but uh, they go into Napa, uh, Burbank, uh, Las Vegas, if, and, and a host of other um, you know, smaller regional airports. Um, I, I flew it a few times out of Boeing Field, really enjoyed the, the TSA free experience and, you know, having an actual small passenger option, even if the destinations were limited, um, I could see that being a great opportunity for, for Olympia as well. Absolutely. I think a lot of times we kind of get tied into that thinking um, as, as the general public of thinking commercial aviation and we think, you know, Alaska Airlines and their 737s, but there are a lot of opportunities for some of those smaller aircraft or like you said, TSA, TSA free experiences um, that are kind of commercial, commercial air service. Yeah, I just heard that JSX, I think they, they discontinued service because of COVID. I think is what I had heard out of Boeing Field. I don't know the reasons why they left Boeing, but I, I believe they're still active in in the rest of their regional their regional stuff. So I, I don't know the reasons behind it exactly. Okay, okay. great, Michelle. Yeah, I'm not um, privy to all the um, uh, aeronautical technologies that are out there, but because we have environmental constraints at the Olympia Airport, I wonder about the, uh, you know, uh, increasing um, uh, funding or increasing um, uh, fund generating from the technologies like infrared um, photography flights. Um, that are becoming more, you know, useful and necessary for science. Um, some of those kind of specialty types of avionics that uh, might generate funds without requiring expansion of the airport itself. Um, and and I, others have talked about new technologies. And, and so that's one of the benefits I would see is really looking into all the new technologies are out there that need some capacity that may not uh, depend so much on growth of the airport, but use of the existing space and increased activity at the airport. Absolutely. And like you said, I mean, you've got a, you've got a great runway, you've got an air traffic control tower. We didn't mention that as a strength, but that's a huge strength is just having that air traffic control tower, even if it's not 24 hours, um, you know, they've got a great schedule and they're covering most of the operations at the airport. And that's huge for any of those um, opportunities that could happen. Yeah, for example, the infrared photography flights, you know, we were going to be bring someone from outside of the state uh, that has that specialty to do those, um, a, a, a pilot project for our agency. It would be wonderful we had the services in the state, um, even locally, to be doing those. So that's just one example. Yeah, great. Thank you. Any other opportunities? Okay. Well, we will wrap up with threats. Um, so again, threats, threats aren't like, you know, necessarily a security type threat, but um, just looking at things um, that impact the airport, airport's future. And of course, the big one is the, the endangered species um, and the impacts that the Habitat Conservation Plan um, could have. So that's, that's obviously a big one. Are there other kind of threats that anyone can think of? Um, I, this is Jeff Powell. I think the threats that we should think about is the opportunity for drone activity. And I know that some drones don't operate around an airport, but some do. And that can be a threat as a pilot. The last thing I want to do is see a drone out there when I'm on short final for an approach. Right. I think that's a real threat. Absolutely. Has there been any, I don't think we've talked about that with, with you, Rudy, but or can anyone kind of 
has there been any education in the community? I mean, have there been a lot of drone issues that have already kind of popped up in the past few years? If there, yeah, if there was, I think Rudy would know best. Okay. Yeah, we had uh, in, in in the last few years, we've actually had one um, incident um, at the airport. We, we were able to investigate and get to the bottom of that. But um, in general, the calls that I get, um, you know, as this the procedures have developed over the years with FAA, um, folks seem to be um, very, the, the operators seem to be very cognizant uh, that the airport is here and, and willing to do an outreach to ensure that they're not breaking any rules. So it, it, uh, it, it hasn't identified itself as a, as a serious threat. It's always there, but it's not been identified as an ongoing problem at this point. Okay, great. I, I heard at Denver just recently that air traffic was rerouting um, air carriers around the sighting of a, a guy on a jetpack. <laughs> so evidently it's not just drones that are out there in our airspace either. There's people on jetpack. Um, Michelle? Sorry, I couldn't get my mute off. Um, I'm thinking about uh, climate change uh, uh, factors such as droughts and increased fire um, threats, both on the airfield, but more importantly, the surrounding the airfield and both direct fire and smoke shutting down operations. Absolutely. We've been having a lot of conversations just about kind of climate adapt adaptation, there we go, um, at airports recently, just in climate resiliency because of that. Those are great. Cameron? Um, well, I would say uh, that an another threat, I guess, to the you know uh, viability and demand for uh, space at, at the Olympia Airport would be the prospect of of this large new regional airport um, popping up in in I any of the, the the short list of locations. I think it'll draw um, you know users away from uh, Olympia, uh, possibly um, in, in addition to to business and 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 other economic opportunities. So that, that could be seen as, as one threat. That's a great one. Absolutely. Yeah, the last thing you want is your business is kind of relocating elsewhere. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, I was thinking that uh, human population growth could be both a benefit, but also a constraint. Um, I could see the continued um, growth of Thurston County, especially around that area in a time when people may not look so friendly upon the airport traffic, especially if we increase you know, increase air, airport capacity, um, the local communities as they grow might start pushing back on that. Mm -hmm. That's a great one. Kind okay. of similarly along those lines, uh, you know, just, we see this all, one of my other as your jobs at WashDOT is I'm the airport land use uh, planner. And so incompatible land uses in and around the airport are, you know, are really what we see jeopardizing in airports future. A, a lot of times, you know, residential moving in nearby and, you know, really that encroachment is kind of slowly chips away at the airport's ability um, so, you know, it might, might be something to add in and look at, you know, compatibility zones. And we, we have a lot of documents on that as well. So. Great. Anyone else have any threats before we kind of move on from the round table? Okay, great. Well, I guess we will continue forward into the aviation forecast. All right, this is Justin Hyde again, and I will be walking us through the forecast. As Leah had mentioned, we're in the, the kind of the draft stage of it, getting all, all the numbers put together and, and starting to compute them to figure out where we're, where we're going to be uh, for looking out into the future as far as the based aircraft and, and operations for the airport are concerned. So what we do and how a forecast works is, is it's a lot of data gathering. And, and so we start with the airport master record for the airport that's put together by the FAA. Uh, gather information from the National Based Aircraft Inventory Program. This is something that was started a little over 10 years ago. And it's uh, the basedaircraft.com website. And what that uh, allows airports to do is input their based aircraft data uh, into the system so that the FAA can track and figure out uh, 
who's counting which airplanes at their airports. And what this uh, allows the FAA to do is figure out who is, uh, which aircraft is at an airport for more than six months at a year. So that, they, that not multiple airports are counting the same airplane. Uh, so nationally, what this has done is it's caused everybody's airplane numbers and based aircraft numbers to go down because there's a lot of seasonal airplanes out there, fractional uh, home sites. If someone has uh, two houses, say they got one there in Olympia and one in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, it depends on where that airplane is more than six months out of the year. We're looking for that six months in a day to be able to count it. And so what Olympia has is lots of airplanes out there, but only, you know, 90% of them can be counted uh, rather than the full 100% because we have to validate that six month requirement. Uh, additionally, we gather data from the FAA in the terminal area forecast and uh, for IFR operations through the traffic flow management counts or the TM TFMSC. Uh, and then we look locally at data from air traffic control records, fuel sales and landing fee data, user inputs and the user surveys are very important as well. So we spend a lot of time gathering the data and going through it to be able to come up with some numbers that on an initial basis. And what the FAA is counting right now is uh, that there's single engine aircraft, so about 95 uh, aircraft. That's your, you know, Cessnas and, and Pipers. And then we got some multi-engine aircraft. There's eight of them, three jets, 18 helicopters for a total of 124 aircraft. Now these are not counting any seasonal aircraft. Uh, like DNR will have a bunch of helicopters come in during the summertime, but those aren't there for six months out of the year and they're actually based and counted somewhere else. So really we're just counting these 124 based aircraft rather than any seasonal. Additionally, we look at operations and, and the number right now in the TAP says that there's 63,805 operations a year, comes out to a little over a thousand a week and uh, just shy of 200 daily. And we and you got the breakdown there. You can see it. One thing that the the TAF hasn't accounted for, and that that um, we want to be able to look at in depth, is the hours or the the operations that occur outside of the hours of operation for the air traffic control tower. That sixty three thousand is right in line with what the tower is reporting. I mean, within a few hundred operations a year. And what we're finding is there's you know between five and 7,000 operations a year happening outside of the, the traditional or operational hours of the air traffic control tower. So that's 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And so we wanna be able to account for that and be able to, to show that those operations are happening uh, within the forecast and, and be able to provide that information to the FAA so that those can be accounted for in future TAF uh, uh, projections. So in operation, when we talk about an operation, it's one takeoff and one landing. And then the user characteristics that we look at is going to be the flight training, recreational flights, business uh, aviation, corporate travel, air taxis, uh, medical firefighting, and just all the different gamuts of, of aviation that occur at the airport. We want to kind of classify and see what, where's it growing, what's happening, what's going on. And then also breaking it down into the operational fleet mix for single engines, pistons, turbines, uh, helicopters, jets, and, and others. Now, in some cases, you have airports that have ultralights and gliders and things like that. So in our data that we're, we're breaking down right now, we have operations by year is reported by the air traffic control tower. And you can see that we've had a little bit of a dip in uh, previous years, but we're on the rebound. And it looks like in, in 2020, we're kind of breaking back up to that 2013 level of uh, post-recession timeframe. And so this is a, a good sign. What we need to factor into the 2020 number is the corona pandemic or, and figure out how to best account for that. The FAA has basically said because of 2020, we're gonna have to look at all the, the future projects will have to be forecasted for and justified for uh, because we can't really rely on a 2020 as a base year. I will say that our data is finding that general aviation is in some airports and especially Olympia didn't take a significant hit as some of the commercial airliners did where they ended up not having uh, commercial flights occurring like they normally would. And general aviation really picked up in, in those times. 
this is another breakdown of that that TAF, and this is kind of by aircraft. Uh, you'll see that there's air carrier operations included in there, but that table off to the right kind of shows that there's hasn't been much. It's it's basically one offs throughout uh, the past ten years. But you can kind of see the breakdown. We have a lot of uh, general aviation itinerant and general aviation local traffic. That local traffic is going to be a lot of training or people doing uh, fun flights, sightseeing flights, and just getting out there and remaining current. With the IFR data that we've uh, found, that's for instrument flight rules that aircraft follow when they're in the weather or training to be flying with uh, limited visibility. We've seen that on the decline. Uh, at Olympia. And, and that's not necessarily saying that there hasn't been bad weather or that it's been more sunny days than, than cloudy days. It's just this is the trend that we're finding right now. And one thing to consider is that some of the local IFR traffic, if they're not hitting uh, the in route computers, then they're not going to be counted in this data. And we know that there's a lot of training that, that is out there. So there's some of those factors that are, we're going to be looking at. One thing we like to look at is the fuel sales. That's a great indicator of where, where the markets are at for the airport and how the traffic's doing as far as it coming in and out. And for the most part, excluding a little bit of a decline in 19 and 20, it's been a, a decent steady on the rise kind of a situation. The 2019 and 2020 numbers, we did see that there, as the operations were up, maybe the fuel sales were down a little bit. And so that may mean that aircraft are tinkering in more of their fuel or they're just buying less uh, at the current times. But you can see that total trend line there is remaining pretty steady over the last 10 years. This is a, a map I like to look at and be able to explain is, is over the last two years, this is the states. The states that are in blue are where airplanes came from or were registered at that have visited the Olympia Airport. And these are aircraft that are over 12,500 pounds and that have stopped in at the FBOs. Now, just because the aircraft was registered in Florida, it may not have departed Florida and flew directly to Olympia, but that is uh, where that aircraft is based or, or registered. Things to look at is Oklahoma and Ohio have, uh, they're predominantly made up of uh, fractional jets or like a net jets, flex, flex jets. People are, are renting the aircraft for, per flight or by the hour to be able to come in and out. And so those aircraft fly all over the nation, picking up people and moving out. And so we, over the last two years, you had 100 aircraft uh, come in just from those types of operations. And then we did have uh, one aircraft that had a China Chinese registration and four Canadian registrations. Uh, that were over the 12,500 pounds, generally jets or King Airs type aircraft. That landing fee data, and, and that's what we use to build that map, kind of also gives us a breakdown of who's the size of aircraft who's visiting the airport. And what we find is that uh, the airport is sitting very strong in a B2. Uh, you can see in the left-hand side, that's the, the B categories for your approach speeds. And you can see the dip in 2020 there in blue, and but the reds uh, for 2019 is probably a more historical, better average without taking in, into account the pandemic. But the, those numbers are very strong. We do see a, a quite a few C category and D category aircraft, uh, along with some threes for the design group. And those are some very large jets uh, that are coming in and utilizing the airport. And they are because that runway is 150 feet wide and, and the length is meeting their needs. So it, it allows airplanes to get in that don't normally fit just that standard B2 category if that's what the airport was built to. As I mentioned, uh, the FAA has basically told us that any project that comes out, um, even one considered being necessary when the, in the kind of the near term window, uh, the mass of this master plan, it'll require some justification. And so whether it's going to be widening something or, or improving something, we just need to make sure that the numbers are matching as far as the users and, and what's needed by the users. It's uh, something that's not very hard, but it's something that we'll have to get used to because this is a requirement uh, coming directly out of 2020. So we're going to be having some focus areas of planning activity levels and, and also triggering events being able to say what is gonna be that, that event that allows us to, to do something and be able to build more hangars. One thing to note is that the based aircraft that are, are out here kind of have a, a slow 
increase. And really we're in a, if you build it, they will come type of situation. There's a hangar waiting list that is so long that they've kind of shut down additions to that list because they're at this point, but until we can figure out all the environmental uh, development concerns, uh, development is, is slowed at the airport. Once that is able to be figured out in the, what comes out of the HCP and this master plan will kind of tell us where and what direction the growth will uh, occur at. So we'll be looking at those planning activity levels and triggering events. Thanks, Justin. So that's kind of a quick overview of our airport inventory that we've got drafted up and then kind of looking at our historical information that is driving our aviation forecast. And so we're gonna be spending the next couple of weeks kind of wrapping up that aviation forecast and figuring out what does that trend line kind of look in the next look like in the next five years, 10, 15, and 20 years for that aviation forecast. Um, so we're kind of in that investigation stage, as I mentioned before. Um, right now we'll be there for a couple more months still. And then we'll move into that solutions phase, looking at our draft alternatives and our preferred alternative and, and evaluating those alternatives through um, kind of the fall and the winter timeframe. And then as we move into spring and summer next year, really looking at implementation and wrapping up the airport master plan. So, um, so we'll be getting a draft inventory chapter and a draft aviation um, forecast chapter. And um, of course the aviation forecast chapter has to go to the FAA and be formally approved. And then we'll be kind of continuing on with that facility requirements and, and alternatives development. Um, so we're kind of where that red flag is right now in May. Um, we would love to be able to meet with you all again in July. So um, look for some potential dates for that very soon. Um, we'd love to hear maybe kind of in a few minutes if this time works best for you. I mean, it seems like most folks were able to attend. Um, so maybe that afternoon time slot midweek uh, works for most folks, um, but we're happy to kind of adjust that to make it work for your all schedule or, or what works for the majority of your schedules. Um, but that's kind of where we're kind of going from here. Um, we'd welcome any comments or questions on the master plan process or um, anything that we're kind of focusing on um, now, or um, you're always, of course, welcome to reach out to Justin or I via email. Um, it's just our first name at theaviationplanninggroup.com. Make sure there's two G's in there at the end of planning and at group. And then um, any formal comments um, about the airport master plan, we ask that you address those to the master plan update email address, which is ampupdate at portolympia.com. Um, so again, thank you again for all of your time. And um, we'd welcome any kind of discussion or, or questions that the TAC members have. Hey, um, Leah, this is Ben Mello from the Seattle ADO. Sorry I can't be um, seeing the screens there, so I'm not sure what the time frame is to get the FAA the, the forecast. Um, could you let me know when you were envisioning getting us the draft forecast? I'm sure you have that outlined on your time frame, but sure. I don't know what that is. Yeah, so we're looking um, likely about mid-June to get that in your hands. Yeah. So we'll be, so, we'll be um, wrapping up in the next couple of weeks, getting that over to Rudy for review and then um, to you. Okay. Yeah. So I'm taking about a month off of uh, work. I'm going to be traveling back to the East Coast to uh, see family. So um, that actually is right at the time when you're going to be submitting that over to us. Um, I just don't want to let you know that um, it may be difficult to have that review reviewed and approved within while I'm off, uh, while I'm not in the office. So um, I just wanted to give you a heads up there. No, that's great. Um, I'll follow up with you and kind of get those dates and then we can uh, go go from there and kind of looking at when that gets submitted. See what we can do. Okay, thanks. Yep, thanks, Ben. Any other kind of comments or questions? Looks like Michelle said early July sounds better than late July for the next meeting. Um, or would it would it sound better? I mean, I think that's probably what we're likely aiming for is an, an earlier in July meeting. I guess it might depend a little bit on the on the forecast review, but I think we can kind of we generally know standards and that sort of thing. I don't think a lot has changed as far as the critical aircraft goes. Um, but we'll we'll coordinate that with Ben and look at and see if we need to adjust our schedule at all. Um, any other kind of comments or questions from the 
committee. One more question. I, I know that you'll be submitting, um, and sorry, I'm, I'm doing double duty here. I've got another meeting that I'm actually listening to, so I'm going to mute that while I talk to you. Uh, apologize for the background noise here for a minute. But um, again, this is Ben Mello with the Seattle ADO. Um, the meeting minute notes, uh, obviously you guys will probably be compiling those and submitting those to us with the participants. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing those when you get a chance so I can actually see your presentation. Uh, like I said, I wasn't able to, to see, uh, view it uh, based on my uh, prior meeting <laughs> that I'm actually watching through Zoom right now. So anyway, um, uh, that would be great to get that presentation so I can take a look at it. And if I have any questions or concerns, I will forward those over to you, Leah, and uh, your group. Sounds good. Yeah. And this Zoom recording will also be posted um, likely later today or first thing tomorrow um, to the web page as well for the airport master plan update. So um, it'll be available on there as well then. Um, and for any of the other members that might want to share the presentation with others. Great. Thank you. Ruby? I just want to thank everybody for your time today. I appreciate your participation. Absolutely. Okay. Well, if no one else has any other comments or questions, again, we greatly appreciate your time um, and your commitment to being a member of the Technical Advisory Committee. And we'll compile some meeting notes for you and get those sent out. And as I mentioned, the presentation will also be available on the website as well. So, and we also encourage everyone to just kind of get the word out that the master plan has started and that the, there's information on the airport's website about the airport master plan update. We wanna make sure that um, everyone in the community is aware that the project has, has started, especially in anticipation of the upcoming uh, public open house that we'll be scheduling uh, in July as well. So thank you all again. We appreciate your time um, and have a wonderful afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Rudy. Thank you, everyone. Lee, did you pass it back to? Working on it. Okay. I think Jenny, you can. Hey, sorry, I'm still here, guys. You're fine. I think you can. Oh, there we go. Make host. Got it. Yep, I am the host again. So I will go ahead and stop the recording.